guys, welcome back to another episode of The Mind of Reese. I am so excited to be coming to you in this brand new little office space that my biz bestie created for me while I was on my um, surprise birthday <laughs> extravaganza with my Mansies. Um, I actually had created a podcast episode yesterday all about the audacity to believe that you deserve more. And I had made this whole episode and, and I realized... After a series of events that happened this morning that I wanted to recreate it because there were some things that kind of led my own journey and mirroring events that happened just recently that allowed me to understand like, wow, this really needs to happen. Why why we sometimes have to be the catalyst for certain things. And I, I just truly believe that, you know, we have a destiny written for us and we do have free will. So we get to choose what destiny we go on. But I believe that like my story, you know, where I believed that I had the audacity to, that I, I, I had the audacity to believe that I deserved more about five years ago when I started to realize that me getting canceled uh, by the industry was the greatest gift, me losing everything from, you know, sponsors clients, friendships, burning bridges, the whole thing where I was going from 90k to zero dollars all it all in the span of literally like 24 hours and utilize this as like the greatest gift from the universe and started to utilize it as my brand message because I believe that your voice, your throat, your truth is your most pros- profitable asset. Your voice is your most profitable asset. And when I had this epiphany, this pivotal moment in my life where I believed where I believed that I deserved more, where I had the audacity to believe that I deserved more, that I could help creatives move through mental, emotional, and spiritual health that would lead them to their success and wealth. Because that was I, I, that was something that I was going through. You know, nine years ago, I had gotten caught. Uh, for taking tattoos that were not mine and posting them as my own. And what's so interesting about this now that I'm looking at this in hindsight, you know, obviously it was my gift of rock bottom. Of course, during the time you never look at it as a gift. You're like, holy fuck, what have I just done? What have I just done? What idiot move have I made? Why would I do that? You know, you go through all those questions and you even look back, you know, and I, and I look back at that photo, which is actually considerably still being posted to this day. I was tagged in it the other day and I've been on so- off social media for about two weeks now. So it's funny when people are still talking about me while I'm not even on social media and they have hate threads still going on about me about this particular photo that was actually posted uh, nine years ago or about nine years ago. Uh, this particular one where they showed side by side the photo I took and the photo that was who, who's it, whose it really was. And that's what basically was my downfall uh, from from where I was, you know, at the height of my career and the whole thing. And I, I think I posted that photo probably, I don't know, maybe seven to a year. I, I can't really, I don't really remember. Um, seven, seven months to a year. And I remember, I remember it to this day. I was like, I'll never do this again. Like, I'll never do this again. But what's so funny about that was that I could have just deleted it. Why didn't I just delete them, right? Why didn't I just delete them? And I truly believe that there was a part of me that knew that this needed to happen. Because if I was smart, I would have deleted it, right? If I was smart, like that would be the smart thing, right? But there was a part of me and this part of me that I understand now is like, Oh, the sweet little girl inside of me that just so desired to be loved and seen. And so it was too much to delete the photo because I still wanted to see like the the praise and the comments in it, even though it was like so long ago, I probably never even checked that piece of content again. And so for someone to go searching through my my page, I think they had to search pretty far in order to find this thing. I was just like, whoa, you know? And I truly believe that there was something inside of me that knew that this was, this needed to happen. You know, I believe that, that, you know, the highest part of me that didn't really have a voice at that time was like, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. So then, you know, so nine years ago, um, you know, got caught, fell from grace, uh, 
Eight years ago, quit tattooing. Seven years ago, I started talking about it. It was the first time I started talking about it. I was like, oh my gosh. I really desired absolution. I desired forgiveness. I desired someone to tell me that I was okay, that I was going to be okay from this. And I didn't get it. I think I did in a, in a little way. Like some people were like, oh my gosh, like kudos to you for talking about it. But I was looking for something. I was looking for relief. I was looking for the pressure to be off of me. And in that moment, I realized, I think a few months later, I realized that I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm still giving my power away to outside sources. It's exactly what I did, you know, you know, 9, 10, 11, the start of my career, you know, when I first started you know, doing this after I got on television, I was like started to like feel this, va- I needed this validation uh, from from people. I needed the validation to tell me that I was a good girl, that I was a good kid, you know, that I, that I was a good tattooer, that I, that I deserved to be on TV. And so I was still looking outside of me even seven years ago, even when I was talking about it for this absolution, for this forgiveness. And so in that moment, I had realized that the only way that I was going to have this level of self-acceptance and forgiveness was for me to have the audacity that I deserved. I believed that. So I had the audacity to believe that I deserved self-acceptance. I had the audacity to believe that I deserved forgiveness. And I didn't need it from anybody else outside of me because it starts with me and it ends with me. That's how I come out of this world alone and I, I leave this world by myself. So you know, and, and so it's like, oh my gosh. So I started to go through that aspect and it it was like, I wanted to go deeper and deeper and deeper and really understand that, you know, it was like this moment of really understanding that none of us enjoy uncertainty and security or groundlessness. We don't seek out vulnerability and rawness. These feelings may make us uncomfortable and we do whatever we can to avoid them. So all I wanted to do was have the audacity to experience life as it unfolds, right? I wanted that. I wanted to understand that I could have glimpses of the sky. So I think about it in an awakened mind, like the universal mind is like the sky in many ways. And, you know, and it's like from our perspective on the ground, the sky appears clear on some days, but obscured on others. But no matter how clouded over or dark it might seem on some days, if we go up in an airplane And go past those clouds, we see a blue sky all day, every day. So the sky is infinite. The sky is what it is. Life is what it is, right? So glimpses of the sky can only come in many ways. They can come in many ways, but they often involve an experience of groundlessness. And this moment of groundlessness was the first time was nine years ago or the first time that I'm really seeing it. And I can you know, go even back further, but from the my own voice and from my own story that I utilize as my profitable pathways, I believe stories, your stories, especially when you're building a personal brand, which is who you are when you're a, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're a coach, you're a artist, a creative, whatever you identify as it's one of those things where you are a personal brand and as a personal brand especially when you want something foundational that leads to this level of conviction that offers you um staying power to continue to say the thing the say to say your message your mission in the online space and knowing you know that you can you're putting yourself up as vulnerable you're you're opening yourself to vulnerability which can often lead to judgment and you know other things that are not very comfortable right those feelings that we try to avoid so when i started to realize this you know in in like i think this was about six years ago i was like i really really wanted to have the audacity to believe that i deserved self-acceptance that i deserved forgiveness and so there was like layers of forgiveness that i needed in order for me to even start to even talk about this. So, you know, we're talking like nine years ago, seven years ago, six years ago. Now, five years ago was the first time I had realized that me getting canceled by the industry, losing everything, uh, was the greatest gift. And I used it as my brand mission and message to help other creatives, you know, through their mental, emotional health, right? So that's like five years ago. Four years ago, I really, really, really started to deepen into this message, really, really, really started to deepen into finding the truth of who I am so that I can continuously have the audacity to be self-expressed in the way that I want to be self-expressed. 
because I knew that the only way that I would feel um, stability was within me. See, the thing is, is that stability is something we desire so badly but we don't realize that it's so impermanent that life is so impermanent that everything is in transition every single moment every minute there's a death and rebirth and a death and rebirth and you cannot stop it you guys oh my god okay so yeah sorry to stop this podcast episode i just needed to let you guys know that worthy wealthy creative the retreat we are going to motherfucking mexico this retreat has literally been my like inner child dream to be hanging out with the goddesses of the tattoo world of the spiritual entrepreneur world so if you are ready to collapse months of coaching into an epic week we're talking a mansion we're talking a private chef branding photo shoots healing circles basically everything you need to recharge and get in the millionaire mindset i fucking double dog dare you to dream bigger and join us in building your tattoo fucking empire let's go it's in the show notes sign up we only have a few slots left so it's like if you can have the audacity to experience life as it unfolds and go ahead and make your plans but be open to seeing them change and when we have this old habit that will be seductive to where we're trying to control again where we're trying to hold this control and go back to the comfort zone of this this feeling of stability where we're like, I just want, I just want it to stay the same because a lot of us, that's what people want. They want everything to remain the same. They want this tendency to control things. So the best advice would just be notice the tendency of control and to own it with kindness and knowing that like we trust in life will work out for us and through us, right? It's like, that's really where my mind has been so in in four years I started having this like this deep deep conversation with myself that I could absolutely not use my voice let things happen the way that it will you know five years ago when I realized this I was like I can absolutely not talk about my story I could just own it and be on my own and like that's okay I could forgive myself and That's it. I don't need to utilize this story at all to, you know, to do anything. It's not, it it, it was just only for me at the time. That using my voice, using my truth to give me freedom was something that I'd so desired. And I realized that it didn't need to be heard by anybody else to, to offer myself freedom because it's mine alone, right? It starts and ends with me. And the more that I thought about this, the more I realized that I was like, well, what am I trying to hide? You know, I, I, I think before I even asked that question to myself, I was like, I was, you know, I had basically come back um, from, you know, like I quit tattooing what eight years ago, then I came back seven years ago, and then was like utilizing kind of like a faceless account in order for me to come back. So I was still kind of really fearful, not still kind of, I was deathly afraid of being, of, of anybody catching me out or, you know, it happening again. And even though I talked about it on national television, it was, um, it was in a place where I thought it would bring me absolution and then I never have to talk about it again. And then when it did, and I obviously had realized what, you know, what we had just talked about earlier in this podcast episode. And so it was one of those moments where I didn't need to, but there was a big part of how I felt like this constriction, like this almost, uh, this visceral experience in my throat to not say something out loud because there was still fear. And I realized that if I did want to make the level of impact that I wanted to make, I was going to have to own every part of me. So I had the audacity to love myself fully for my past, for everything, every little quirk, every little mistake. I desired freedom so badly and I also desired my my voice to be heard. Because I believe in the thing that I'm talking about. I believe in my values. I believe in my message. And, you know, four years ago, that's when I became a coach and started to really deepen into this. And this is when I was really, really obsessed with 
telling this story over and over and over again and to really allow my my throat to be felt and seen and of course when we're in this vulnerable state we offer ourselves as fuel for fodder for people to judge you and of course there's this like there is this level of trust that needs to happen and it's not this level of trust that I'm going to be successful because when I think of trusting in success I I think of the way it's like you think things will work out in the way that you want them to for me I trust in life I'm trusting in life is much more open and a relaxed frame of mind. Life is going to take place whether you want it to or not, and we can count on that. Life is, it just is. It's free of our hopes and our fears, and knowing this can be so open to full emotions to this human experience, to what this human experience has to offer us. So all of this pervasive suffering that we have is a constant struggle against the fact that everything is happening. Life is going to fo- unfold as we go along and that these very little and, the, and that there's very little things that we can do to control that. So it's not really impermanence that makes us suffer. What makes us suffer is wanting things to be permanent when they're not. And so for me in this moment, I realized I was like, well, I'm going to trust in life. I'm going to, you know, surrender to what life has to offer. I'm going to keep moving in this direction and realize that life is going to life whether I want it to or not. Whether I spoke about this or not, I would, you know, for me, it was like I would still feel a sense of loss. I would still feel a little part of me that wasn't fully fulfilled. And I would still feel this sense of um, responsibility to, to, to be and do more. Uh, in service to others and in service to myself as well. And when I thought about this, I was like, yeah, I could either have everything stay the same. I could continue to make really good money. I was making great money, you know, after, you know, even as a faceless account, my art, I kept my head down. My artwork got really good and I was making great money. Nobody needed to see my face. It was fine. And then there was this part of me that just still felt like I was hiding. And I was just giving the highlight reel of, you know, as we do on Instagram. And I was like, oh my gosh, the very thing that I am obsessed with, the very thing is mental, emotional, and spiritual health, wealth, and vitality in my life. I am still giving my power away to outside sources, to all of these other people outside of me that I think have a say or dictate what I do in my life. And I was like, how much deeper can I go? So I kept going deeper. I kept saying the thing. I kept sharing my story. I kept refining these stories and understanding that my stories get to be so perfect. And it was so interesting because the other day, you know, of course, the thing that happened nine years ago, as though it just happened yesterday, not that it didn't happen over 2,000 days ago, over 2,000 days ago, what we're talking about, No, nine years would be 3,000 days ago, would be almost 3,000 days ago, not just yesterday, but someone posting about it like it was just happening yesterday and being so crazy hurtful. And they said, this girl doesn't deserve any of her success. And I thought, that's interesting. I like that because I had the audacity to believe that I did. And I still do. (laughs) And all this does, it doesn't mean that I'm not human and I don't feel that, but it's so impermanent. And since I believe that I am not here to trust in the success, I'm here to trust in life. That life is going to life, whether I like it or whether I want it to or not. Free of my fears or hopes or dreams or whatever. Life is going to life. And by knowing this, I get to experience the full range of emotions. I'm not trying to be the one that avoids, you know, the feelings of uncertainty, insecurity, and groundlessness. Actually, it is in those moments where I get glimpses of the sky. Glimpses of the sky can come in many different ways, but they often involve an experience of groundlessness. It often involves that. And it was so interesting because I was on my way to go get the mail 
And, you know, your body is always trying to release things. And so when things pop into my head, I always look at it as like, "Ah, what a blessing, especially when, you know, it's like you open your phone and someone's talking shit and you're just like, man, man, (laughs) man, can you really like, you know, and, and as spiritual as I am, I'm still fucking human. Like, bro, like, can you get a life? Like, I don't even know your name, motherfucker. And you have my name, like, mouthwash in your mouth. Like, you keep swishing my name around in your mouth and spitting it out and then drinking it back up because you're so mad at me and you keep me in your, you know, I live rent free in your mind where I don't even know your motherfucking name, bro. Like, and I find that to be helpful in some ways in my ego way where my ego just needs a little like, mm, you know, and like the little girl in me needs like, a, like, yeah, you know, those moments where, you know, it's like, yeah, we'll be back. you know, And the little girl just needs like that moment. But then I also realized it was just like it, it like the, this 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 thought came through in my mind of this and and then and then a fear thing happened, you know, and, and the fear, the fear thought was what if this really does hurt my business? What if these people wanting my downfall hurts my business? And I could feel the anxiety come up in my mind. And and then it brought me back so quickly. And this is why I love, I love being spiritual. This is why I just love turning in collaboration to the universe because I turned and I was like, well, if that's meant to happen, then I trust that God's going to, that that's the reason why it's going to happen. And God's going to show me the way that why of why. And it was all of a sudden, all of this feeling in my body just left me because all I didn't trust the fact that it would all work out in the way that I wanted it to work out. I trust that that life would work out. I trusted in life. And it released this suffering, this constant struggle of me trying to control the way people see me, right? Because at the end of the day, the only thing I got control of is my responses to life. Life is going to life whether I want it to or not. But I have the control in my it to my responses. And you know what? I'm always going to believe, and this is where I ground myself into the audacity, the audacity, and I'm going to continue to talk about it because we know that I have a program coming out called the uh, called audacity. Like I had the audacity to believe I deserve more and I still do. I have the audacity to believe that I deserved self-love and self-acceptance. I had the audacity to believe that life will always be life in and I am okay. I'm going to be okay no matter what. That I have the audacity to understand that it's not impermanence that makes us suffer. Like, oh gosh, I just wish everybody would just see me in this certain way and this da 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 da. And it's like, actually, can I just know that I'm always constantly in transition and that nothing is permanent and how great and freeing that gets to be so that this moment over here where this person is talking shit is literally a fleeting moment. Literally a fleeting moment. Because all of a sudden, you know what? I woke up this morning. Not I. I woke up this morning feeling like I was thinking about it. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go into I'm gonna go into meditation, and I'm gonna sit with this feeling, and I'm gonna know that God's got my back. I'm like, all right, God, you let me know how you want to work through me through this. I'm gonna continue to know that I'm on the right path because it feels so fucking good and scary and exciting all at the same time. And I do have the audacity to utilize my motherfucking voice, and I will continue to use that voice. You know, until I have to go somewhere else, like until I have, you know, and I am over here always trying to be in the, in the truth of what I know, you know, and, and that's it. And that's all I can do. It's like, I only know what I know now. Right. So I'm in this meditation and I am, I'm like, okay, yeah, like this is going to be really great. I'm going to have this meditation. I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it to God. And all of a sudden I had this feeling of, I was it was a really weird, anxious feeling of me being pulled so far out of my body. Like I like astrally left my body and I couldn't see anything. I didn't see anything. I didn't, I only felt it and it felt like I was facing the floor. And I felt like if I opened my eyes, I would face the floor. But I was so conscious. I was like, am I falling asleep? Like I had to ask. I was like, no, I'm not falling asleep. And I was still in this state. And it was this moment where I was like, can you just trust? And so I trusted and I let go. And it was a very profound experience. And 
I let go of everything. My mind, I was no longer my mind. I was no longer who I was. I was like, oh my gosh, thank you for the reminder that I am I am still a spiritual being having a human experience. And although I am hu- my human is humaning, like my human is fully humaning, thank you for the reminder that I'm also a spiritual being. And this is so like a minuscule thing in the entire blip, an ant in the entire grand scheme of my really tiny existence on this planet because the planet is still going to move with or without me. It's still going to move with or without any of these haters and all this stuff. Like it's oh, like these things are just going to continue to death and rebirth and death and rebirth. And so I get out of this meditation and I was like, that felt really, really good. And I felt like, oh gosh, I, I let that, the part of where like the hate was like, you know, kind of taking up little parts of my day, taking me out of the moment. And I was like, okay. And I get this call from my sister. And it's like six in the morning, you know? And I just got it out of an hour of meditation. And I was like, yeah, my sister. So I answer the phone. My sister goes, I need your help. And I was like, okay, what, what happened? And, um, you know, I had given my nephew a car. If you've listened to that episode, it's a few episodes back, I think about two months ago, I think I gave him a car. Um, my father passed this year and I gave my nephew the car that was, uh, basically given to me or I inherited rather. And I wanted to offer him this car. Now my nephew is the sweetest, sweetest boy. He's so sweet. He's not even a boy. He's 30 fucking years old. He's only like seven years younger than me. Uh, my sister had him when she was really young, but it, was one of those moments where when she was like, he got arrested. Um, I think it was, I think he said he got resisting arrest and he got a DUI. Car got impounded. His phone was still in the car. My sister said that he never switched the name over. And that if I could drive up to Marietta And which is like a three hour drive, traffic, it's three hours, I think it is. And uh, drive to Marietta and go pull the car out of impound, pick him up, go pull the car out of impound and that, that, that. And as she's saying this to me, I am fully open to being downloaded. And I just said, you know, um, just to give a little background on my nephew, he has been a troubled soul most of his life. I mean... Uh, young age, you know, with my sister and uh, the guy and that she was with and they're no longer obviously together and then dealing with um, my sister's last ex who she was with for like 10, 15 years and he was just very militant and um, just different towards towards Michael. Michael has like a softer soul. Hey, he's always been drugs, alcohol, that kind of thing. He's had a DUI before. I have had helped him out getting a car out of him being towed and um, these kinds of things. And, you know, he's just he's just like a little bit of a lost soul. And I love him. And I just I'm like, he's just a sweetheart. He means well, all the kinds of things. And so um, as my sister is telling me all of this, I realize I'm getting a download in my mind that was like, I'm not giving him back that car. And when I asked her, I was like, do you think this is the right decision to give him back the car? And my sister being the best sister in the whole fucking world, I love her so much. She goes, if that's your decision, I support your decision fully 100%. And I was like, damn. because I was really nervous to ask the question. But my whole heart and soul was like, if this were my son, would I give him back the car? And I wouldn't. And the whole day... Like I realized I was like this the whole day I kept thinking about what I wanted to do. So I told her and she's like, well, he's going to call you and he's going to ask for your help. And, you know, whatever you want to do, I support 100 percent, you know, and I, and I could tell she she is very much she's bailed him out every single time he's ever went to jail. She's always been she would give the shirt off his back. She'd buy him a new car if she could like that. That's like the whole thing. And so for me, it was like this really interesting opportunity. And it reminded me so much of gosh, I feel like I'm going to (laughs) cry. It reminded me so much of the gift of my own rock bottom where I could have just deleted it. Like he could have just changed the name on the car like he was supposed to and be responsible but he didn't and I didn't delete it and I I was offered my gift of rock bottom 
And oh God, to be the person that has to offer that kind of gift is like not what I wanted to do on a Sunday. <laughs> it's the last thing I wanted to do. And honestly, like throughout the whole day, I was like, I know I'm not going to give him the car back. So I just wanted to know what I was going to do with the car. I was like, am I going to go get it? Am I going to go sell it? The whole thing. So it wasn't really that big of a deal. I was like, I knew this is what I was going to do. The one thing that really broke my heart, because I know my sister, how much my sister's heart is already broken. Um, you know, so much, so much to unpack there. You know, she's living in Florida. She left her husband, like the whole thing. It's just, been it's just been a rough you know eye-opening spiritual awakening for her and for this to happen to her son who are like they're like besties you know it's just it's really really hard and it's really tough and if she didn't need me if the car wasn't in my name she wouldn't even fucking call me she would just be like yeah all right just go get it here's the money go get it out you know but that wasn't the case and this was the first time that someone wasn't going to bail him out and all I was hoping was that I was like, I just love my sister so much, but I think that this would be a disrespect if I would give it back to him, to myself and to her. And I know that she couldn't do this. She wouldn't be able to, to not give him the car back. So I I said, I, he, you know, I wanted to leave a message. I was a coward. I was like this cowardly coward. And it's funny because it's this, this is what's so funny about how I see life and not that I need everybody else to see life like this, but it's just such learning lessons. So Friday, gosh, how long is this podcast up? It's going to be a long one. <laughs> so Friday, I had this deep meditation that I was in and I saw myself making 100K. And I was like, wow, whoa, 100K, um, not 100K, 100K months consistently. Like I was making 100K, 100K, 200K. Like, you know, it was just happening. And I was like, oh, my life. You know, but with great power comes great responsibility. And I understand, I think the thing is, is where people get really gnarly, like people don't realize that they're actually not fear of failure, they're fear of success. Because oftentimes we don't understand. And then when we do, when we're smart enough to understand the responsibility it comes to hold that type of energy, to hold the, to hold the bigness of energy. So you think about, like I think about 100K months, right? When we think about 100K months, we talk about 100K worth of impact, 100K worth of people coming into my space and, you know, buying into a result and a transformation that I believe that I can get them, right? 100K worth of energy, 100K worth of time, commitment, you know, purpose, conviction, 100K, like 100K months. So we're talking about over a million dollar years and more, and and even more than that because I saw myself 200 I even saw myself a million dollars a month and I was like oh my life and I could feel like oh my gosh that level of success is kind of scary because there's the other side to it there's always another side to it there has to be the law of balance there's a balance there's a balance that's always going to be made so there's law of polarity right so the goodness comes with the other stuff so the moment that I came out of the meditation, I felt so good, was the moment I saw the hate thread. And I was like, ah, I see you, God. I see you. I see you, you cheeky, cheeky, you bastard. <laughs> like, like, I see what you're doing. I desire bigness, impact, wealth, freedom, community. Well, can I handle that level of polarity that comes with that? Can I handle that people are going to be talking lots of shit about me, calling me a scab, saying that I'm using what I had someone leave me a long paragraph about how much of a scam I am and how much people um, and how much I'm a fraud and like so pathetic and a clown and all of these just like really hateful things and they like went out of their way to find out who I was like they called me out on the thing that happened nine years ago they were like and then you're teaching this and you're using this terminology and you're you know blah 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 and you're you're still you're taking money out of artists hands and and all this stuff and I was just like wow you know interesting and of course, you know, I don't ever believe anything, especially when I don't believe it to be true. I'm like, I know my intentions. I know I'm not a scam. I know I get the results for people if they desire the results for themselves. Like I look at results as a two-way street. It's like I can offer you everything that I've ever done for free on the internet, which is like on my content. You can literally grow a business from my content, 
or you can come into my spaces, collapse time even faster. But a relationship means a relationship. It means that you have to also put 100% into this relationship to get your own results. Like I'm not here to do it for you, right? I'm not a consultant. I'm a coach. Consulting, now, that's a different vibe. You'd be paying me (laughs) to do it for you. And that's a totally different thing. And so I was like, no, I I believe everything that I'm about. But of course, it still hurts. My human hurts. And so it was funny. All of a sudden, you know, I'm back, you know, fast forward to today where I'm about to like send this message to my nephew and give him basically the bad news that I'm I'm not going to give him the car back. And I was a coward. I was like, I don't want to I don't want to have to have this conversation. He texted me, so I was like, well, he he opened the pathways to only doing a text. So I was like, let me send him a voice message. So I sent him this voice message basically telling him that I wasn't going to give him the car back. And then he calls me literally the moment I send the message, and I was like, fuck. And in that moment, all I could think about and if you guys have been listening to my last podcast episode or if you guys are in the arc, you know we are in 31 days of surrender. So it's like oh, the surrender experiment. And in the book, The Surrender Experiment, Michael A. Singer talks about how the things he didn't want to do, he wasn't going to let his personal preferences stop him. If life was going to life, he was just going to let life life. And so it was this moment where I answered this phone call and my nephew gets on the phone and I know I could tell he hasn't even heard the message I sent him because it was literally two seconds ago. So of course he didn't have the time. And he goes, auntie, I fucked up real bad. Like I have no excuse. Um, I was yelling at my friend and he was going through the story of what it was. And, and uh, he was just like, yeah, like I got out of the car, started screaming at my friend to get the fuck out of the car or whatever, whatever. And then it was just like, he was like, neighbors called the cops, cops came DUI, resisting arrest, all this stuff, whatever, I don't know, and impounded the car, essentially. And he's like, can you just come tomorrow, help me out, get the car out, and all this stuff. And I just said, um, oh, God. I said, Michael, and this is like the, like, nobody ever wants to have a hard conversation. Of course, everybody from third-person perspective is like, Reese, you're going to do the right thing. You shouldn't give him back the car. Like, you know, duh. But when you're in it, and you're actually having the conversation with someone, I was like, I literally was like thinking to myself, I was like, no, this is a boundary. No, I know I'm going to hold this boundary. But of course, it's the hardest thing to tell someone you love that you're like, no, I'm not going to help you out. And all I could think about was like, God, like, I know my my rock bottom was such a gift, but to be the one that had to, to do it because I knew this was going to hit him hard. and 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 so I was just like, it was a disrespect to me. It's a disrespect to your mother. I has, and because I love you, I'm going to get the car out of impound and I'm not giving it back. And the begging and the crying and so much. And I could just hear it in his voice how, you know, like this felt like the end for him. And, and, and I have so much compassion for that because I've had rock bottom to where I felt the same way, where I thought I lost, like when I say the terminology, I lose everything. I do it in air quotes because of the fact that I'm like everything. When in hind, when I look back, that's not true. You know, I had people who, who loved me, who didn't understand what was happening. They're like, Reese, it's not, it doesn't sound like a big deal. To me, it was a huge deal to this industry, huge deal, you know? Um, And then also it was just like one of those things where, you know, they didn't, if people like, I still had a, you know, place to live. I still had my understanding of, you know, like I still had like my faculties, like I, you know, there was like so many things there, but like in the moment when you think you've lost everything and I know that he's coming off of being drunk and he woke up and he doesn't have his phone, it's still in the car, all of these things. And to tell him that, and then for him to start like, begging and pleading me it was like the hardest thing to hold my ground because like every two seconds he could have talked me out of it I, I was just almost like I could feel myself wanting to be on the verge of being like well maybe we'll discuss whether or not you can have the car back but I just kept saying no and then I had to hang up on him I had to be like hey like I was like hey honey I'm so sorry and I love you so much I'm not giving you the car back and I'm gonna have to get off this phone right now I love you and I hung up And I started to cry. (laughs) I didn't think I was going to start to cry. I started to cry because I never, like, I've fired people before. And I've had hard conversations before. 
And as much as like, I've loved the people that I have, you know, have done that too as well. It's like, it's never easy. And it was so funny. Andy comes down and I'm bawling and I'm like, I know I did the right thing, but it hurts. Like, it just hurts because I understand. Ooh, I understand. I understand what it feels like to hit a rock bottom, to think that you've done the worst thing in the whole world and to feel like nobody has your back. You know, and I think that it's so human, you know, and I think that's the reason why, you know, hate comments that it never gets, it never gets like easier when people still want to think things about you, you know, but it's one of those things where I was just like, I know by me holding that loving boundary was love for him and love for my sister for something that I know that she could never do. And I just felt horrible and it didn't feel good. (laughs) And it was so funny. It was so funny. And he comes down and he gives me a hug. He's like, honey, you did the right thing. And he goes, think about it this way. He's like, you desire, you know, big impact, big wealth. You had the audacity to use your voice. And it's so funny for him to say this to me because of the fact that I've been utilizing this terminology because I've been building this program. He's like, you had the audacity to use your voice, to use your truth as you saw fit. And this isn't a coincidence for the fact that this all landed in your lap because it all relied on you because the car was still under your name. And so you learned a lot because you know how to hold big energy in your body and still hold a fucking boundary. And that is million dollar moves. He's like, that's million dollar moves. Literally. And it comes back to business because I'm obsessed with business. And it always makes me feel really, really good that I can hold something like that, hold big feelings in my body, knowing I'm doing the right thing, even when people are saying the opposite. My nephew, please, please, begging and pleading, or people online calling me a scam. But I still use my voice because I know it's my truth will not only bring me freedom in life, the freedom in my business, financial, time, joy, fulfillment, all of the things. And so the more that I can have the audacity to believe that I deserve more, that I deserve self-compassion, I deserve boundaries, I deserve love in my life, I deserve success. I release the constant struggle against the fact that life is going to unfold as we go along and there's very little I can do to control it. The only thing I have is my truth, my voice, and my response. And that's it. Everything else is so impermanent and how beautiful does that get to fucking be? (sighs) So that is it for today's episode, you guys. What a whirlwind. But... What great stories. Stories are everything. They are everything. Your stories are your power. They're the claim to your to to your freedom. And so in the last of this, I would just love to invite you to audacity. Unleash your voice and claim your power. And just realize that your story deserves to be shared. Your voice carries power, purpose, and presence. And in this, it's a five-day immersion, a throat activation experience designed to help you amplify this message and step into your next level. Everything, you know, everything to where you can utilize your stories and turn that purpose into profit right? To turn your passions into profit, to turn your stories into profit. Your message is so important. And having been a person that has gone deep, deep, deep into the somatic body work on how to move from fear and hesitation to unfuckwithable self-expression. So this isn't only just an intellectual, uh, like, information course we're actually going to go into the bodywork tools that I use for myself that really allow me to liberate my voice to clarify my message and to amplify my influence and I believe in everyday life 
it always comes back it always makes a full circle back into everything that you desire so the things you desire right the thing that i asked for i said i want 100k months consistently i want a million dollar months consistently Oh, well, boy, universe is going to give you exactly what you need in order for you to hold that level of space, right? In order to hold that level of energy, because all it is, is it energy? Can I hold that level of energy within my body? Can I calibrate my nervous system to, to understand that this isn't actually ambitious, like these, these desires aren't actually ambitious. All I have to do is just really shift how I can hold that within my own nervous system, within my body. And so we will utilize our own nervous system work to rewire your body relationship to fear and allowing you to stand in your power and to make bigger, bolder, braver moves. Because when you activate your throat, you activate your six to seven figure voice. I love you guys so fucking much. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I will see you guys in the next episode.